Good morning. Oh yes, I just checked my watch. It is 10.31. It is time. I'm so grateful to see all of you here this morning in the house of the Lord that we get to worship together and, and uh, praise our, our Jesus. So we have a few things going on. Um, please make sure if, if you need prayer requests, there are cards in the pew there. And if you're a visitor, you can fill out uh, that card as well. This uh, morning's activities are on page six and seven, and you can see all of the events that are going on in the life of the church. Chancel Choir starts on the 31st at seven, so uh, they would love to have you come and join them. And if you have any questions, see Joel there. Our church picnic is going to be um, on the, what is it, the, the 8th. <clears throat> so, 18th, September 18th. It's not in my notes, I'm sorry. And I didn't bring my bulletin up. I'm sorry about that. So anyway, it's on the 18th. It will be at uh, Rodney and Laura Alcantar's house, and you can see um, Centennial Hall. There, there will be sign-up sheets there. So barbecued meats and hot dogs will be provided, and then sign up to bring your favorite side dish. And if you have any questions, see Jenny Thompson. And then we have desserts that are needed for Tommy Robertson's service. If you are um, able to, please donate either homemade or purchased desserts to, and bring it to Centennial Hall by Tuesday, August 30th. And if you have any questions, contact Charlie Dodge. And then they will be, you will be there um, in the evening before, correct? And so they can drop them off the evening before as well. And then we have birthdays and anniversaries. Um, Riker Lyle has a birthday today, and Brianna Formont has a birthday on the 30th, so we wish them a happy birthday. And then there is no Sunday evening study tonight. That's been canceled for this week. So now let's just uh, let the cares of this world um, fall away, and may our focus and attention be on the Lord, that he would speak to you this morning and through the music and the message, and that... Um, you would just find delight in the, in the joy that God provides for us. Well, let's stand for the call to worship. Holy and loving God, we come to you with hopes and fears, with convictions and doubts, with pain and joy by your Spirit. Help us to see all things in the light of your word, our Lord Jesus Christ. By your Spirit. By your Spirit. Let us worship God.
the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you do not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus Lord and Savior
before God unless we are first honest with ourselves about who we are, about the mistakes we make, and about how well or poorly we care for others. In this spirit, let us offer our prayers to God. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to me what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open us to a future which can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world, Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace.
Jesus Christ be with you all. Also with you. Please share the peace with each other. Peace. Peace Thank you. You do that. Oh. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for all your prayers for my family. My mom is in heaven. That's awesome. Um, I have two helpers today, and those are the only two who showed up, so that's good. <laughs> good. Um, Nathan, I want you to stand up and tell me what, here, tell me what you're holding and its purpose. Uh, Flipple? Cakes and stuff? Hey, it has a purpose. Call it. Periscope. We all have a purpose. We have in our life, right? <laughs> well, Ananias didn't know Paul's purpose, but God explained it to him in Acts. Nine, verse 15. He had a purpose for Paul, and um, 
Paul was, well, at that point, he was still Saul. <laughs> but he didn't know what was going on. Knocked off his horse and blind and all this stuff, and then Ananias had to go talk to him, and Ananias said, hey, wait a minute, I don't like this guy. He's mean. But God told Ananias, this all has a purpose. We all have a purpose in life. We're chosen by God to do a certain job. And sometimes we don't like that job. Sometimes it's hard to do that job. But that purpose, Paul was to preach and tell everyone about Jesus. Everyone. Kings and queens and Jews and non-Jews and everyone. And we have that same purpose. We have that same purpose. And God will lead us through that purpose. Pray. Thank you, dear Lord, for showing us the way that we should go. Sometimes we don't even understand where we're going. Sometimes it's so hard we can't see the light. But you are living in us every single day. And you guide us. You give us purpose. Our purpose is to praise you, to thank you, and to obey you. We appreciate everything you do for us every single day. Thank you for this day, this sunny day, and for the people here today who are loving you every moment. In Jesus' name, amen. As we worship the Lord together in a time of giving, if the ushers would come forward for the offering. Good morning. Well, this week we are engaging in a third of four sermons on the same text. And today we want to talk about this conversion text of Saul according to God, to look at it from God's perspective. And the reason we can do that and not be presumptuous about it is that God speaks 
and gives us his perspective of what he's up to in Paul's conversion. So, I'll read again. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 19. Follow along with me in your Bibles. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. When he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless, and they heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when, they, when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Ananias there was a disciple named, sorry, in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, and placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. It's the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that your word would come and speak to us with conviction and power, and that we would learn to submit our lives to your sovereign will, for it is good. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Name something that you recognize as a great event in history. Name something that you look at your own life about and describe it as a process of overcoming something in a way in which you look back with gratefulness for. Look at major figures in history and who they became and how they lived their lives. Can in all of those three types of things I've just mentioned, could you say that it corresponded with an easy task, an easy life, with easy instructions. It never does. I am one who loves reading biographies, particularly of historical events in which tremendous odds uh, were overcome, times in which a person rose to a position of leadership despite great odds, or someone having experienced uh, great success in life coming from the lowest of places. And in all of these stories, not once does it describe an easy task, an easy set of instructions, easy circumstances that all just fell into place in such a way that very little was asked of the individual and very little was asked of those around him or her. 
it seems like great things require great strength of overcoming hard things. And when we read this text from the perspective of the Lord, he is describing the fact that he has great things planned for a particular individual. But the great things he has planned for this person who at the time here is named Saul will have a lot of struggle, a lot of sweat, toil, and tears on the road ahead. And that only God, who calls a person to this task, can give them the strength to overcome the difficulties that this task will bring. And we hope in looking at this text together that we can see the ways in which God is, in fact, doing the same thing for us in our own lives. He's calling us to follow Him with conviction, but He also is being honest about the fact that this call comes with costs. And as we count the costs, we do so understanding the ways in which the Lord is involved in this in amazing ways. Now, in the first week, when we looked at this text, we talked about the fact of the conversion of Saul according to Saul. What, what is he noticing? What is he experiencing? Well, he has been stopped in his tracks and it completely has completely been obliterated his plan for his future. Saul has a life in which he has a religious pedigree. He studied under the best uh, rabbi around, Gamaliel. He was one who was the right hand man of the leaders of the synagogue and the ruling Sanhedrin. He was the one whose commitment to the faith was trusted by all of those in religious positions. He himself uh, talked about the ways in which his entire life has been led up to this point where he could be a trusted, faithful follower of God, and he was one who had the resume to back it up. Philippians chapter 3 describes this in full detail, and yet God stops him in his tracks, and everything that he thought, everything that he thought was for gain, the Lord turned around completely. God interrupts his life and turns it around. Last week with uh, Pastor Brian, we talked about the fact that with Ananias showing on the scene, God has a plan for Ananias in this way, that he looks to another follower of the Lord, and he does not affirm him in his fears. He does not kind of comfort him in his anxieties. He does not come alongside of him and butter him up. He says, you know what? You have a task too. And he pushes Ananias out of his comfort zone. He does not let him sit behind closed doors in fear of who this man Saul might be. And with faithfulness, he goes and meets with Saul. And the remarkable conversion unfolds with him speaking the words that the Lord would have him speak. The conversion of Saul according to God in these first two instances were he had a plan to stop Paul in his tracks and he had a plan to push Ananias out of his comfort zone. Those two things are clear. But the rest of our talk today is going to be focused on just two verses. Verses 15 and 16. Where God's plan is to choose Paul to spread his word to the world. And God's plan is to choose Paul to suffer for the name of Christ. And they go together. The first one is amazing, in which we can look at historically, is that when God chose Paul to spread the gospel to the world, he was faithful in doing this. 
The book of Acts plays it out, and so does a large portion of what we call the New Testament plays this out. For not only there are letters that Paul wrote to churches, but for someone like um, the others, they even mention Paul, particularly lots of texts in the book of Acts, from which we're getting this text. And Paul did not, after his conversion, become this amazing missionary right out of the scene. He went to Arabia for a good long time. He himself had to be trained in the faith. It wasn't like this conversion happened and he became a great church planter. He became a great speaker. He went out and did these amazing things just like that. It takes time for someone to be discipled in the faith. And it's a piece that's often missed in the book of Acts, in which he went away for some time, quite a number of years, in fact, that he had to be trained for the task in which God was calling him to. There was patience that had to be required in this. There was trust that God was at work, even when he was not being used in the way in which he was described in this text. It would come at a later date, but man... I've written in here in the notes that uh, Ryan Nelson describes this. Paul's missionary journeys helped spread the gospel throughout much of the ancient world. Over the course of his ministry, the Apostle Paul traveled more than 10,000 miles and established at least 14 churches. The book of Acts records three separate missionary journeys that took Paul through Greece, Turkey, Syria, and numerous regions you won't find on modern-day maps. In fact, many of you, if you have a study Bible, you can go to the back and look at the maps and you'll see the three missionary journeys of Paul and the ways in which he traveled with uh, a number of companions engaging in missionary activity. Uh, Some scholars argue that Paul took a fourth missionary journey since parts of the New Testament appear to reference travels that may have taken place even after the events in Acts. We have the letters that Paul wrote to churches, let alone the ones he wrote to his friends like Timothy and Titus and Philemon. But he wrote letters to churches in Rome, to Corinth, to the churches in Galatia and Ephesus and Philippi and Colossae and Thessalonica. And in these books, particularly the book of Galatians, for example, he makes a strong defense, a theological defense for Gentiles, people who were not raised in the Jewish faith to simply be part of the chosen people of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And he rejected very strongly the sense that they had to become engaged in uh, the practices of the people of God, including circumcision, in order to be engrafted into the people of Israel. Everywhere he went, as a Jew, interestingly, He himself preached to those who weren't Jews. And we get to the great place where Paul even shows up on the hilltop of Athens and the place where Roman temples were were, um, placed. And he went along to all the different places of uh, Roman gods, from Apollos to Zeus to Aphrodite. And he found one to a tomb, or it's not a tomb, but a um, temple to an unknown God. And even there, he preached the gospel about Jesus Christ, saying, this unknown God that you're coming here to worship, he has a name. He was bold in his faith. He was powerful in what he said. And yet he even admits in his own humility that he was not an eloquent speaker, Uh, People thought he talked too heady. Uh, People were unimpressed by his presence. He must not have looked like a celebrity pastor. He looked like an ordinary guy, and he was kind of defensive about this in the book of 2 Corinthians. You know what? What really matters is my faith in Jesus Christ, not my amazing kind of manipulative presentation like others are doing. Paul was bold, despite all that came his way. And we are the beneficiaries of this 
very reality in that we continue to read these books in the New Testament written by Paul on behalf of these churches, and we kind of per, we look into these letters and we see ourselves being spoken to in these ways. The reason we read the book of Galatians now is because still to this day, it's because it's in Scripture, but even more so, it says that you are not justified by your works. You are not saved by all the things that you do in this life. You are saved through faith alone, not by works of the law. We preach that. Why do we preach that? Because Paul wrote that because he lived that. He himself lived by the works of the law so completely that he thought he would be commended for it, but in Philippians, he describes it as trash and rubbish, all my past things that I've done. Because what's most important is that I have faith in Jesus Christ. The reason we read the book to Corinth, 1 and 2 Corinthians, is the, some commentators call this the church of Christians gone wild. They are misbehaving in a variety of ways. They are uh, misusing funds from the church. They are, in fact, uh, preventing people from coming to the Lord's table. They are involved in deep sexual sin. They are involved in boasting and be pride in their philosophies. And Paul has to get after them. He wrote two letters to them. We know at least the third that he wrote we don't have because they were uh, ad an adolescent church. They were an immature church, and we have to read these texts to describe the ways in which we are called to grow up in our faith. And in the midst of this kind of letter, almost from like a father to a son, we, we get this great text of 1 Corinthians 13 about love and growing up into what love looks like, and the great theological text of 1 Corinthians 15 on if Christ has not been raised from the dead, our faith is in vain. We could go on and on and on about the various books that we read in Scripture, but they are, in fact, written for us here. People um, who need to know the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and Paul was used in this way to spread the gospel to the world. And his missionary journeys are an example for missionaries who go out into the world to the places where the gospel has never been preached, where there is no book to be opened and read, where translation has to occur, uh, where someone has to get involved in the culture to learn the ways in which um, their own pagan beliefs can now be lovingly challenged and pointed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is all through the career of what God had planned here, this came true. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings, which he does in Jerusalem. Herod, he gets an audience with. And he gets an audience with Caesar. Caesar. It's not recorded for us, but he appeals to Caesar, and um, which is why he ends up at the last days in Rome. The Lord had a plan for his life. But you would think that the Lord has a plan for his life would kind of be accompanied by, I don't know, the continual parting of the water so you walk through on dry land. And this is not what happens. The one who was given this message, the Lord says, and this is Scripture, friends, and this is the Lord speaking to Ananias, and I think that Ananias likely repeated these words to Saul when he went to see him on Straight Street. I'm just a messenger Here's what the Lord said. And the Lord says to you, Saul, I will show you how much you must suffer for my name. Can we just pause and acknowledge that's a tough text? When we talk about God having a loving plan and purpose for our lives, 
we don't usually think of adding to that how much we will suffer for his name. And in fact, we may even go so far as to say that the presence of suffering for his name may be evidence that he's not really involved anymore. That maybe he has, in fact, withdrew his protection upon us because of some sin or failure or inability to trust him. This is not what Scripture says. And Paul recognizes this when he writes it in 2 Corinthians 11. He describes his life. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I have received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Five times. Four more times than Christ. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. He was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked, and beside everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches." God loves you, Paul, has a wonderful plan for your life. Or how about this one? The safest place to be is the center of the will of God. I actually like that phrase, but we have to redefine what safety means. Because this isn't safe. Nothing about this is safe. It's risky. It's dangerous. And friends, this is just describing physical pain. Paul also will describe in 2 Corinthians an emotional pain where he says he prays three times from the Lord to the Lord to take away a thorn of the flesh. You remember this? A messenger of Satan to torment him, he says. All he hears is, my grace is sufficient for you. What's God up to in this? What's his purpose in this? This is where we get on dangerous ground. For me as a minister to tell you the purpose behind God's plan in this. Been looking at Job lately. And of all the things that Job went through in his life, we get to the end of the book. Did God kind of spill the beans and, and let him know what he was up to? No, he says, You know, where were you when I made the foundations of the world? Who were you to question the Almighty God? All we know is that God uses pain, uses heartaches and struggles in ways to form and to fashion us into those people who will have stiff spines, and also to form us and to fashion us into people who, in fact, are able to show grace and forgiveness when Rejection and hatred and enmity are only natural to arrive from places of pain. And I wonder, and I just wonder out loud, if Paul was someone who was defined entirely in terms of his identity and his purpose by his resume, by all the things that he said he was good at, the ways in which he was devoted to God, the ways in which he was devoted to the religious temple, the ways in which he was praised for all the things that he was doing. 
But now Paul was going to be defined by nothing that he had done, but only by who he is in Christ. That the way in which pain is used is to see the ways in which God is at work in the world through Jesus Christ by what Paul will later describe as, I want to know Christ and to participate in his sufferings. Why would you ever say that? It's only because that is the place where we see Christ more clearly than ever. I'm reading a biography of uh, Lou Holtz. He was the uh, fiery Notre Dame coach for many years. Uh, I grew up watching Notre Dame fighting Irish with my grandfather, who was full blood Irish. And it's, been a, it's a book called Wins, Losses, and Lessons. And he describes the early years before he became well known as a great coach of being fired by, from jobs, trying to find coaching jobs, having struggles in his own personal life, being bounced around um, from place to place. And he writes this in the early pages, and he himself is a Christian. He says, this was not how I envisioned my life. I wondered if God was testing me or if I had somehow rejected or misinterpreted his will. My wife and I prayed a lot, though, and turned to Scripture for guidance. And one passage jumped off the page. From who? It was from the Apostle Paul, his letter to the Romans. Chapter 5, verses 3 to 4. Paul wrote, We also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Well, I didn't feel much like rejoicing, but I wasn't about to give up either. He later describes a passage from St. Peter saying the same thing, that we're called to rejoice in our suffering and not be surprised by the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. And Lou writes, this is a natural part of life, as long as it doesn't destroy you for it builds character and helps you define your priorities. We don't like suffering. We don't want suffering. We don't pray for suffering to come. However, when we are in the thick of suffering, God calls us, and Paul writes this, that we are to look at it differently. We are not to look at it as something as evidence that God has abandoned us. That we are not to look at it as something that, in fact, we have gone down the wrong road. We are not to look at it as somehow God's plan and purpose for who we are and what we are to become is somehow being thwarted by the things we are going through. We actually see it as the raw material by which God works to make us something that we could not make on our own, producing this perseverance. You don't learn perseverance apart from struggle. And character is not developed in us without attending to the need to persevere. And we don't have any hope apart from our trust in what God is doing in and through the things that we experience. Which is why we are to look at and to understand difficulties in our life differently because of our faith. Another book I've been reading, uh, recommended by a friend of mine who is a former pastor and a Christian counselor, called Dark Clouds and Deep Mercy by Mark, I can't even pronounce the last name, it's Mark Vrogop. Um, and it's a book about the importance of entering into the difficulties of our lives with the important aspect of lament in faith. He writes this, Belief in God's mercy, redemption, and sovereignty creates lament. Without hope in God's deliverance, 
and the conviction that he is all-powerful, there would be no reason to lament when pain invades our lives. Therefore, lament is rooted in what we believe. This is a crying out to God and asking for help. This is the prayer of Paul. Lord, take this thorn from me. Christians affirm that the world is broken. Christians affirm that God is powerful. But Christians confirm that he will be faithful. Therefore, our cries to the Lord in the midst of what we're dealing with stands in the gap between pain and promise. And so, he, he mentions that we are to pay attention to a third of the Psalms. One third of 150 Psalms are this kind of crying out to God in the midst of suffering and struggle. We sang one today, um, Psalm 46, um, which I love the song. Glad Joel's put that in our rotation. And it's from Shane and Shane uh, writers. So if you like listening to music online uh, or in your music app, Shane and Shane have a number of albums called Psalms, just plain Psalms. And I went to an Eco National Gathering conference uh, a few years back to Dallas. I've been listening to a lot of Shane and Shane songs. And they were there leading worship for the week. And man, when Psalm 46 came up, I was as deeply embedded in that song as I could ever be. Lord of hosts, you're with us, with us in the fire, with us in the flood. Paul knows and understands the deep importance of working through the struggle and the suffering in our lives to see it as part of and really attached to his purpose for us. For each step of lament is part of a pathway towards hope, Mark writes in this. There's four parts to a lament. There's an address to God, a complaint, a request, and an expression of trust and or praise. In the address, the heart is turned to God in prayer. And then a complaint clearly and bluntly lays out the reasons behind the sorrow. I have a complaint, God. Isn't it great that we can say that? But from there, the one that laments usually makes a request for God to act and to do something. And finally, nearly every lament ends with renewed trust and praise in God. This kind of deeply immersing yourselves into the truth that God is not absent from our suffering, that he is working it out for good, that he is, in fact, using all the raw material of our own biographies, the things we've struggled with, to make us into the people that he wants us to be, is the very thing that enables us to move forward in this life and to push us more and more to rely less on our own resume and to trust in Christ for all things. This is why Paul is able to say in Philippians 3, Whatever was gained to me, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things as loss compared to the surpassing excellence of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have lost all things. He gave up everything to follow him. Furthermore, I consider them rubbish, trash, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, he even says, being conformed to him in his death and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Being conformed to Christ following Christ, is following the one who suffered and died for us, but whose suffering has the greatest purpose of all time. It was God's will that Jesus would suffer on our behalf. And it is God's will for us who follow him to be lights to the world, on, for the name of Jesus Christ, 
but knowing that, in fact, following him brings heartache and trouble and struggle. But it is through that heartache, trouble, and struggle that we find peace, that we find joy, that we know a love that knows no ends, without conditions, without parameters. It is a love that will not let us go and a love that we can share with others, agape love, one that does not ask for anything in return. I look at this text in closing as something pretty powerful for my own life because God is involved in and not absent from struggle and heartache and loss. He's in it. And he knows where we've been. He's walked in our shoes. He is not unfamiliar with what we go through. He, in fact, knows all things. And therefore, he can help us walk on the road ahead. God bless Paul for spreading the gospel to the world. God bless Paul for choosing to suffer for the name. And may God bless us as we seek to see God's hand in our lives as well. Let's pray. Lord, help us to surrender our lives to you. To let them be truly yours. And help us to look at struggles in our lives as the very things in which you were not absent, but you were at work. And if we are presently in the midst of the battle, help us to trust even as we address our prayers to you, even as we complain of what we're going through, even as we make requests that you would change it. Help us to trust and to praise you in the midst of it to rejoice in our sufferings knowing that you are producing something in us that we could never produce on our own. A deep and abiding faith in the one whose love will not let us go. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.
reading from Romans chapter 1, where Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that says, by faith, from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Friends, be not ashamed of this gospel and live it faithfully, knowing that he will see you through every dark cloud and rough valley, for he is with you and he will never leave you or forsake you. Amen.